Welcome to the NYU Steinhardt Jazz Interview Series, and we'd like to welcome saxophone legend, Mr. Azar Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your crowd is obviously Greenwich Village. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, We've done many interviews here at NYU, and I want to talk about your career moving from uh, being a student of the music to moving into the professional world. That bridge that happens between those two is usually something that's, that's different with everybody. It's like, how did you, who opened the door for you to give you these opportunities? But let's talk about, you grew up in California, in LA. Right, Los Angeles, California. And how did you get inspired to play music? Uh, interesting enough, my mother was a, a, a very gifted pianist, and uh, she uh, taught uh, sixth grade, and also gave music lessons uh, after school. And uh, and uh, I have an older brother, Vincent, and uh, he and I both somehow, uh, through her uh, nudging, shall we say. Uh, playing, vi I was a violinist in the USC Junior Orchestra at five years old. I was second string uh, violinist. My brother was a first string violinist. Uh, started off uh, piano and violin, and uh, we owned a, a five flex. But there was a big family that we let them have the, the, the big space, and so we were upstairs. And uh, my first real instrument was drums but we quickly found out that that wasn't gonna work. <laughs> so uh, then we moved downstairs for the rest of the duration at that particular spot. But okay, so then uh, the violin was fine up and through the sixth grade and the seventh grade, but then as my, well actually I used to sing too. My mother would play piano uh, for the sixth grade assemblies and what have you and, uh, and I would sing and uh, you know, uh, she would play the piano and accompany me. Then once a year, she would have a uh, recital where uh, I would play violin and she would play, we'd have a piece worked out and all of her piano students would also perform. So uh, we moved up to a place called Baldwin Hills, which uh, was a you know, very ritzy place and uh, my father moved us up there. And What did your father do? My father was an entrepreneur. Yeah, he worked for the county, uh, that was his day gig, but uh, he uh, actually uh, moved houses uh, back in the day when you could, you see him on, uh, on trailers moving from one site to another. He would, when they made the freeways uh, in Los Angeles, the uh, no toll rolls, uh, this, now they have toll rolls in certain spots, but we call them the freeways, and when they were uh, constructing them, a lot of the houses were going to be dis, uh, destroyed. And my father had the insight to go in and move them, uh, they, you know, to other locations and sell them. So, he, how did you get into jazz? Well, okay, so the, the so the jazz thing came. So, uh, I was my voice, internal voice, and external voice was dropping, you know, during uh, it got lower. And so, what happened is that uh, this, my father had a friend. They used to come, we had a pool, and he'd come in uh, on some occasions on a Saturday and lay by the pool and uh, play his flute. But one day he came and brought an alto saxophone. And when I heard that, I was like, oh man, you know, because I had considered going uh, to a, a lower instrument like a cello or a viola. But uh, when I heard that alto saxophone, so at any rate, so my father got me an alto and I started taking uh, lessons, private lessons. And uh, what happened is that, uh, some through people in school, in high school, I happened to go to a Dorsey High School, who, which had a guy named Dr. Simpson that was our instructor. And he had been with the Tommy Dorsey band as a bass player. Mm -hmm. And man, he had so many, so much wisdom and knew how to communicate it to us. And we had uh, the jazz workshop. They had a regular band and then, you know, the big band and, and, a, and a jazz workshop, which I, applied for, and uh, my mother was a jazz buff. She played jazz all the time in the house, in, in the car. When she got out of the car, my brother would turn it to the, 
R&B station. And when she got back in, she <laughs> turn that back, boy. So, so, we, so I heard John Coltrane, Freddie Hubbard, everybody, you know, was on back then, I remember. But at any rate, so uh, uh, the jazz workshop through that ex uh, class, I started meeting different people. There was a guy named Herbie Baker who uh, passed at an early age, but he was a pianist that was not only a prodigy, but he was the actual reincarnation of a Herbie Hancock or a McCoy Tiny. He was the actual person in a young body. And he was my friend, and uh, we used to play together all the time. He was very inspirational. And uh, Freddie Hubbard wanted him to leave, you know, was inviting him on to come on the road. And I mean, that's how prolific he was. So uh, being with him, uh, I started meeting other people, the Strada Brothers, that led me to the Horace Tapscott Orchestra. And uh, uh, he called it the orchestra, like it was an ark, like Noah's Ark, the orchestra, in which uh, he allowed or provided an opportunity for young people like myself that were of a certain caliber to mingle with people like Arthur Blythe and uh, uh, all the great people that were in there. Uh, oh man, uh, Jimmy Hopps, I don't know if you know who he is, a great drummer. There was a lot of people, including Horace Stotzgat himself. So uh, in my senior year, I was playing baritone uh, with the Horace Tapscott Orchestra, which performed every Sunday at a Fauche uh, High School. So and through them, I ran into Reggie Golson, Benny Golson's son, who became my best friend. And I was at the Golson house uh, daily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's daily even during class time. <laughs> so that's when Benny was doing film scores out there. Benny LA. was doing films. Uh, he lived at the top of King's Road, which is at the top of the Hollywood Hills. He lived at the very, very summit of, I mean, he was at the very top, and when he came out uh, from New York, uh, he had to park his, uh, the big moving van with all the furniture down on, ho on Sunset Boulevard and have a smaller truck back up. They had to back, because you know, you couldn't turn around, the, the streets were so small, back up to the very top. And the last, we passed Davy Jones from the Monkees, the Davy's house, the, you know, and then at the very top was Benny's house. So I was there uh, daily. Reggie Golson had the most r records I've ever seen, the biggest record collection. He had a whole room just full of Lee Morgan, this, and he played everyone for me, John Coltrane. I mean, I heard John Coltrane because of my mother, but I mean, he was like, he was giving me classes, I mean, you know, every day. You, you, know. you, you didn't hear Coltrane live. I was too young, yeah. yeah. I certainly was. But what uh, were those records? Because we certainly hear Coltrane in your sound. Oh man, he, well, yeah, that's, you know, and I tell people this, it was because I listened, uh, he was playing, uh, oh, he and Elvin Jones, he and John Coltrane were close friends, and uh, Benny Golson told me about two years ago that Reggie knew Duke Ellington better than he did. And Reggie used to tell me about his trips on the, uh, when they would go on the road, he would go on the road with Duke and the bus and, and uh, John Coltrane and Elvin Jones was really good friends with uh, uh, Reggie. In fact, he had, uh, Reggie had, uh, was a drummer and had uh, a set of uh, Elvin's uh, drums. And so we used to have a little band and play together and Reggie played drums and other piano players, up and coming people. And, and the guy was telling you about Herbie Baker and you know, rest his soul, he passed at 17. And uh, when he passed, uh, um, I said to myself, they almost shut the school down. I mean, it was, he was that much of a hero because we, uh, the jazz workshop, uh, there was a, a competition. All the schools in the Los Angeles had um, jazz workshops. And at the end of the year, there was a competition that took place at the Hollywood Bowl. And, we, and it was like three years and I, we won each one, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fauché had Patrice Russian and then Dugu, Chancellor, if you know those names. But uh, uh, it was quite uh, invigorating to one's musical. Now, did you play saxophone with Benny, or was he on hiatus from playing saxophone at that time? He was on hiatus. But uh, he, was, he had one of the first synthesizers I ever saw. It looked like a, a, an old uh, operator, the telephone operator station. <laughs> it was upright, and it had those little where you plug in, you know, different chords and stuff, mm -hmm. and the keyboard here, and that's, he was back there doing that. 
but uh, he would he definitely uh, answered all questions. Mm. You know, I asked him about it, and uh, he said she grew up with Train. Yeah, they were yeah. best friends. Yeah. Well, and he told me all kind of stories about uh, John, and uh, but Reggie told me all the inside stories and some of the bootleg <laughs> stuff that you hear of John Coltrane now. Reggie had it then, mm. and we played it. In fact, uh, so then one uh, after a number of years, well, just a couple of years, because uh, after I graduated from high school. Uh, uh, Elvin Jones was coming to town to play at the, at the Lighthouse, which is a famous jazz club there. And uh, I had seen Elvin uh, through Reggie. He knew all the club owners, and we could sneak in the back, you know, mm. of, the, of the Shelley's manhole. Uh, you know, he knew the, the guys. So we go in the back. I saw Miles there, and Elvin when he had Jimmy Garrison, and this guy named Jazzbo. So I saw people, but this time Elvin was coming to play, and Reggie said, come on, Zara, and we jumped in his Volkswagen bu uh, bug, Beetle, went out to the airport and picked up Elvin Jones and his wife. And so uh, uh, then, uh, so the next night, or later that night, actually, they played at the club. So Reggie said, man, bring your horn, man, you might be able to play. I was like, oh, cool. So I had my soprano. <laughs> so uh, when I went out to the club, I was sitting in the audience, and then the, Somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked back, and it was Elvin. He said, yeah, you might get a chance to use that thing tonight. I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> Boy, I got, oh, see? But, uh, you know, that's startling with Elvin Jones tells you that. I'm like, I was thinking, what would we play, you know? But, uh, uh, so, but I, that didn't happen that night. But then after the gig that night, he said, yeah, man, uh, uh, you know, are you busy tomorrow? I said, no, what's happening? He said, I'd like you to come over to the hotel and uh, uh, play with us some. I was like, oh, for sure. So uh, I went over there, and it was Steve Grossman, Gene Perla, which was right here, playing bass with us tonight. And it was a, a quartet. It was two, you know, and then and myself. Right then, it was, was just it one Liebman there, too? No, Liebman had gone. Oh. I didn't know anything about Liebman at that time. And uh, so I, you know, they counted off a few songs I played, and, and uh, shoot, afterwards I was packing up my horn. I was like, thanks for the opportunity. I knew, you know, I, I knew I didn't get it, uh, you know. He said, well, man, you with me, aren't you? He said, I got a plane ticket for you. I'm like, what? Yeah, I went home and told my parents, hey, man, I'm out of there. They're like, yay, go ahead. Go on. <laughs> yeah, see, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to be here. No, she would, though. But uh, yeah, my mother was a big promoter. of. Uh, she told people, she said, hey, you know, she always wanted uh, one son to be a musician. So she was pushing me, and my father was the one that would go get the saxophone. What do you need? You know, he'd get that. and. And she was like, you know, she was, yeah, 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 go boy, go boy, you know, that's what she loved it. Was there ever any thought in your mind of another occupation besides me? Well, actually, I was a science major through high school and through the first couple of years of, of college. And I had planned to be a doctor or something. Mm. Yeah, I had planned to do something. I never, I, rec I don't want really to regret it, but. I never took any music classes other than the performing classes. I didn't take harmony, although my mother had me analyzing Bach and all that, you know. She taught me harmony, but as far as uh, the classes, then, you know. So when you joined Elvin, did you feel you were ready? Well, yeah, I was ready because of the Horace Tapscott. I mean, I took band classes, big the, uh, the jazz workshop, and in college I was in the, band, in the jazz band. So my reading was like, boom. You know, and, and symphony reading. I mean, you know, so the reading thing, you know, and then I had been playing with my own little group. And the Horace Tapscott, I have to emphasize, Horace Tapscott was such a prolific player himself and an orchestrator, and uh, allowing, uh, you know, an 18 year old to play alongside outside, uh, with Arthur Blythe, mm -hmm. you know, who took me under his wing. And, you know, he's on my first actual album uh, mm -hmm. at. Uh, which is another story where I get to. But uh, so uh, Elvin Jones, then we're flying out two days later. And uh, so who is in the band now? OK, who's in the band is the great Gene Perla, who's playing bass tonight, mm -hmm. and uh, Steve Grossman and myself. And so it was two saxophones. Steve Grossman, if you don't know, is a, a very is a great, prolific saxophonist. And uh, he had just left Miles, come to find out. And so uh, we went off as a quartet, no piano. Um, then Steve went off to go with Miles? No, point? no, no. He had just left Miles, from ah. what I understand. Yeah. Okay. He had already been with Miles. Okay. So, um, 
And now, uh, and Dave Liebman had left Elvin's group and gone with Miles, so that's oh, why okay. there was a hole there. And I had little did I know. But uh, yeah, so then we went, uh, and Elvin said, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, we'll, you're so young, we'll adopt you, and you can stay with us, you know. Uh, Do you have any idea, I mean, besides your playing, how they chose you and not somebody else who was already on the scene? Well, because Reggie Golson, Golson okay. Benny's son, my best friend, yeah. had told Elvin that I was the cat. And, uh, and so he gave me a shot. He gave so, me a shot to... So that's the bridge into the... That's the guy that opened the door. Reggie Golson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Reggie Golson. And what was it like, life on the road with Elvin Jones? Oh, it was wonderful. It was new, and Elvin and his wife, Keiko, were, were trying to be like parents. <laughs> Oh yeah, they were trying to be. Oh, they were wonderful, and then I ended up staying, uh, you know, living with them, and you know, I had a certain a diet. I was vegetarian, and she was like, "No, you got to eat this meat. It's good for you." No, and stuff <laughs> like that, and you know, it was good, man. And uh, Elvin taught me so much. I was with him at that time for about two and a half years, and I always wanted to play with McCoy Tyner. But every time, let's say if we played at the Village Vanguard, I could see that McCoy was coming in the next. Uh, next week, but then we would be going somewhere out of town the next week, so I never had a chance to uh, be there to listen, you know, or just to hear the group. And one time, uh, Elvin, uh, we were playing at the Village Vanguard, McCoy's group quartet with Sonny Fortune was coming in the next week, and Alphonse Muzan came down and introduced himself. And he said, oh man, he said, I'm gonna tell McCoy, you're the, you're the sound that we need. I was like, oh, okay. And so he said, uh, we're going to be in town at the right here at the Village Vanguard next week. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, if you want to come down and play, I'll arrange it. So I knew that I was going out of town. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, then I got a call. Uh, Elvin got a call, and that gig was canceled. So I was going to be in town. So I went down, and, uh, and next thing you know, uh, uh, you know, I was introduced to McCoy. And I had met him once before with, through Horace Tapscott, but he didn't, we didn't reference that. And so, uh, yeah, he said, hey, do you want to play? I said, yeah, man, I'd love to. So now, how old were you when you joined Elvin's band? I was just about 19 years, I was 19 wow. years old. And, and then McCoy Two and a half years, years, and I had just turned 21. Because I wasn't supposed to be able to be in the clubs. Wow. Yeah. Well, I've listened to the McCoy records, and I've seen the videos online. That's a pretty high-powered, high-energy group. Uh, it was probably good to be that young. <laughs> I, I don't know how those guys uh, kept that energy up, but that was that was yeah. pretty amazing. Well, this guy reminded me. He said, "You know, McCoy hasn't been uh, he hasn't been away from the John Coltrane group that long, so yeah. you can imagine. I never heard them live. You know. So, were you the first sax player that he had in his group since he he joined the uh, group, uh, mm -hmm. since he left Train? Sonny Fortune, I know, is the uh, only one. You know, uh -huh. I mean, I'm sure he did stuff with Wayne Shorter and. I mean, not in his group, but record albums. I, you know, Joe Henderson, not in his group, but you know, I'm sure they did performances. But in his personal group, which was really just getting off the ground, kind of. And uh, yeah, we used to ride around in, a, in his station wagon from city to city, and then fly to places where we, where we had to fly to. But I mean, like Boston, we'd drive up there and in a station wagon with everybody in it, and the bass and the drums and everything. So how was the band received at that time? Very popular? Uh, it became, well, you know what, it actually, uh, we had great crowds and it got better and better uh, after we did the first record. Uh, you know, the very first record we did was the Enlightenment Suite. And, uh, you know, uh, we flew to Europe. Uh, it was my second time in Europe, but uh, I went over there and we went to Kongsberg, Norway, which was the land of the Midnight Sun. And that was very disorienting, you know. I was like, "Ooh, we!" I was closed the big thick curtain so the sun doesn't come in. because 11:30 at night, the sun goes down to about a uh, like a sunset. And then mm -hmm. about 2 a.m. it's back up full force. So McCoy had called me around 3 a.m. or something, 3:30. He said, "Yeah, man." He said, "You want to play?" I said, "Oh yeah, what the heck? You know, that's what I'm out here to do." So we went down and met him downstairs in this little room behind the lobby and. Uh, there was a piano, and he showed me those songs. Uh, you know, Walk Spirit, Talk Spirit, you know, Inner Glimpse. We went, he and I went over them. Then around 
or so, uh, Junie Booth was playing bass and Alphonse came down. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alphonse brought a snare and a cymbal or whatever. And, and we rehearsed it, rehearsed it for a little while. Next time I saw him was at the uh, sound check for the performance. Mm. And it wasn't written down, it was, you had to remember it. So uh, then we played a few of the songs. And next thing you know, we were uh, out there recording. Mm. Wow. Did McCoy ever talk about his time with Coltrane? He, yeah, he and I were very close. Mm -hmm. And still are very close, but uh, he used to tell me a lot about it. Um, and Aisha, his wife, you know, uh, on occasion would tell me that that uh, McCoy looked upon me like himself when he was with John, with Train. You know, he felt like you know that I was in that same position, you know, that he was because he was very young. So uh, yeah, he would tell he and I were very close, and uh, sometimes if we were working a week up in Boston. Uh, he and I would get, since his family was down in Jersey, and so, so was mine, we would drive after the gig down, and then the next day he'd pick me up and we'd go back. Mm -hmm. If it was like a four hour drive, we'd come back to see our families at the time, and, and all that ride, you know, we was, he was giving me a lot of information. Did he give you any direction playing the saxophone, playing his music? No, he didn't. That was the good thing. I think if he had to have said too much, I wouldn't have been there five and a half years. <laughs> you know, yeah, he didn't, he just, no, he didn't talk. He, he, was, he did tell me one time, he said, well, vibrato is good. Makes, vibrato makes the sound strong. So I was like, okay, well, 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 you know, made some vibrato then, you know. But wow. yeah, it was, uh, we had an understanding and he told me, I, you know, I asked him, I said, man, how can you play with a guy like me after playing with the great John Coltrane, he said, well, I just think that you and John felt the same way, feel the same way about music. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh. Well, I, I clearly hear that in your playing. I hear uh, his approach and some of the things you do. It was a fit, thank yeah. you. It was, yeah. it was a marriage and, uh, because, you know, I never, ever, maybe once to learn a melody, but I didn't take the, the John Coltrane records and play along with them. And nor, I mean, it was before the transcribing thing. I never did that. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. People, uh, we were, uh, McCoy, we were somewhere, and a guy walked up to him and said, oh, man, here's the thesaurus of scales. Would you sign it? Man, I know you, your work in there. <laughs> he said, the, the what? He, you know, he wouldn't even, you know. Who, McCoy? Yeah, he yeah. was like, the thesaurus of scales. He said, uh, what, my work in the, he had, like, the guy thought he had, you know, had just, like, was playing out of that book, you know. Well, did McCoy ever talk about his voicings, his fourth voicings, and how he played percussively? Is, is that something that Train wanted him to do? No, I think that they, uh, they grew, you know, it was a marriage. Mm -hmm. They grew together. And uh, he did say that he, you know, thought of it as a, a horn shouts, mm -hmm. horn shouts. That's the way his voice sings and the way he uh, played the percussiveness. I uh, interviewed Steve Kuhn years ago, and he was kind of holding the place for McCoy. McCoy was under contract with Benny Golson and the Jazz Tet, so mm. he couldn't get out of that contract to join Train. So I know Train liked his playing for a long time before he could actually get him in his band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, interesting enough, because uh, Benny was telling me that uh, uh, he and John and John Coltrane were at uh, uh, John's apartment up here in, in the city, and and McCoy was supposed to, was on his way up the Turnpike to uh, with his wife and kids to join Benny Goldson's band, mm -hmm. and uh, he had car trouble and called, and man, he said, "I'm broke down. Can you come get me?" And Benny said he didn't have a car, but John did, so it, John went down and got him, and that was the end of it. <laughs> I was there to the said he's glad that it happened now, but of course he was going to understand it. Well, wait a minute, when he got back, McCoy had joined the Don Coltrane wow. group. Well, let me ask you, as uh, we get into the 70s, commercial music becomes uh, more prevalent, I guess. Um, and and I, I see in your bio you were working with people like Roberta Flack, and Marvin Gaye, and uh, later Earth, Wind, and Fire. How did that transition happen? There's a lot of jazz guys 
I, I shouldn't say a lot of jazz guys because the 70s was a lot more open it than it is today. Mm -hmm. But how did you feel about that? Well, I felt wonderful since, I mean, I was with, uh, I don't know if you ever uh, heard of the Watts 103rd Street Man. Mm -hmm. uh, Express Yourself, that song, mm -hmm. Charles Wright. I was with them. Uh, I mean, uh, I was with Frank Zappa, uh, Eric Burden, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, when he formed War. You know, uh, I mean, uh, since uh, in the late 80s and the 90s, I was with uh, the rock group Boston. Mm -hmm. You know, Fog Hat, Jay Giles. So did I play music? Did, I mean, you know, did you find uh, a way to fit your style into that, or was did they ask you to present? No, they never. Way? I've never been asked to do anything but this. Uh, in fact, I've been asked on a couple of occasions. Hey, man, just do you, man. Mm. Yeah. In fact, I went to Japan a couple of years ago with uh, Harvey Mason, the drummer. And he was like, yeah, man, no, 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 I don't want you to play any kind of way. Because I played, uh, you know, I played whatever the music, if it's a country western gig, you know, you'll think I'm a country western saxophonist. Yeah. Which I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any, any country western gigs? <laughs> <laughs> no, but as a songwriter, too, uh, you know, um, I wrote three songs on the Powerlight, Earth, Wind & Fire uh, mm -hmm. album, Spread Your Love, Hearts to Heart, and Freedom of Choice. I wrote the music, and uh, Maurice White uh, wrote the lyrics, and B. Lloyd Taylor, they uh, um, did the lyrics. But the music that I wrote on one of the first uh, recording devices, like, you know, the Tascam four-track tape recorder cassette that I was working on, and I had a profit uh, synthesizer, one of the first synthesizers when it became really digitized, and you know. But at any rate, uh, you know, Maurice White, the leader of Earth and Fire, he uh, would, you know, actually we share some, uh, uh, some theological, religious beliefs, and he knew that, and so when I ran into him one time, I, I was already writing with Chuck Jackson. Chuck Jackson's a singer that wrote, uh, he and Marvin Yancey were the producers for all of uh, uh, Natalie Cole's hits, her first hits. And so uh, through a lady named, uh, we called her Chocolate with Grand Central Station. But Patrice Banks uh, was a friend of mine and she introduced me to Chuck. And he lived in Baldwin Hills too. And they would come by on their way to his house and stop by and listen. I'd play a few songs and he'd take those. And he was one of the most working producers in Los Angeles. Yeah, so I, we did uh, Stanley Turrentine's uh, Coming Home album. And I wrote the, the title track. and three or four other singles on there. Uh, Irene Carr, and I mean, just a whole bunch. I was every, every month he had at least two artists, and, and I played, I, I was a piano player. I wrote from the piano the pop stuff, so he, I had a little knack, a signature in it, so they asked me to play the piano on this. I was playing next to Michael Boddicker, who was the top guy at that time. I was like, oh, shoot. Well, I just played my little stuff, you know. Was this in L.A.? Yes, this was in L.A. And so were you involved in uh, like the, the jingle business and oh, I, as well, all that stuff? Well, after that, so, okay, so after I wrote, uh, I was writing with Chuck one day, I was uh, sitting in front of a, uh, uh, I had taken my uh, wife and kid, a uh, child, to the movies, and a, a Porsche pulled up behind me, and wow, lo and behold, it was Maurice White. Now, I met Maurice White through Entume, uh, who wrote Juicy and... Uh, the Closer I Get to You, and he's a percussionist, who also was, in the, uh, he brought Miles Davis down to hear me a lot, and that's why I ended up working in recording with Miles Davis. So, uh, any rate though, I had met Maurice White with Intume, who was mm -hmm. doing my record up, uh, one of my uh, records uh, for Fantasy Prestige. Intume is whose son? He's Jimmy Heath's son. Right. Yeah. So. In your bio again, it says that uh, Miles had asked you to join his band at some point, and you didn't feel ready. At, at well, no, time. no, it wasn't that I didn't feel ready, but no, I mean I did performances with him when we recorded the Dark Megas live at Carnegie album and stuff, and and he uh, was wanted me to go to Brazil and stuff. But personality, you know, it was you know I, I didn't get it, so mm -hmm. I, I just you know I just opted to stay with McCoy, which. You know, then I was trying to do my own thing, and then you know, I you know, 
I came back out to Los Angeles and started putting my own group together. But yeah, no, I did some, I did quite a few performances with Miles. But he wanted me to go to Brazil, and then I heard when he went down there, uh, the audience didn't understand why he was standing with his back to them. But he was like conducting, like they understand when you go see the symphony, the conductor has his back to you. He's conducting the orchestra. So that's where his concept was coming. They didn't understand it. And this, that, and the other. But, um, you know, I, I mean, in hindsight, you know, uh, I, 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 I go with my decisions. I, I follow my first mind. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any, like, oh, man, I wish I had a. What I learned, I learned just from the few performances, the very first night that we performed uh, was live at the Carnegie Hall there and uh, the Dark Megas album. And it was like at least, I got at least like 50, 100 years worth of experience was just dripping off of him. It was just, you know, you could just, you bump up against him, it's like, woo, so your arm tore and turned gold or something. <laughs> yeah, it was, he had so much experience on him. It, it was just, oh, I was like, I got a mouthful. I was like, okay. And each time we played, it was so much experience. So, you know, it was cool. I, it, I did my time. Everybody has does what their takes their time and does their time and so uh, I'm assuming Miles didn't say anything. How did he direct you? Uh, he didn't. He just uh, at, well the very first time I played at when I was at Carnegie Hall, uh, Grossman I mean not Grossman but Leadman was on the gig still because mm -hmm. he wanted to, he wanted me to take his place and so which eventually I did but just for a, a hot minute there when it was in uh, transition. But uh, the f very first gig, uh, I didn't have a, 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 you know, a microphone implanted into my horn. I was just trying to play into the microphone. And so, uh, I mean, it was hard to hear me. So I, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And I looked around. He had taken uh, a Liebman's horn from him, from him that had the microphone. And he was standing there, like, had it like this, Miles did. <laughs> I'm like, OK. <laughs> this is why everything's going on while the music's going on. But uh, it was wow. fun, yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you this because we have a lot of students in the audience and, and they're looking for a path to pursue a creative like, life like you have. Um, clearly, you've, you've, uh, you've moved with the times, right? You've found other opportunities that you could access your creativity with. What advice do you have for these kids that are uh, trying to do something like you've done? Well, you know, I had, uh, just as a, uh, an example, I was uh, talking to Farrell Sanders, who's a good friend of mine, and who had played with, uh, with John Coltrane. And so some of the sounds he made, man, sound like everything. I mean, you know, some of the sounds, they turn the saxophone mouthpiece upside down and screech and screams and scrub, but they're all. So when I, t I said, man, you know, we were riding in the car, and I said, boy, that was, that was really something. You had to really be courageous to do that. He said, you have to be creative. And you know, that's all I've done is uh, try to be creative. If this is a creative uh, field. You know, you just get creative, get within yourself, and uh, try to find your inner voice and, uh, you know, and project that to others through your instrument. That's what it is, the connection. And then, uh, I, you know, I, my, at first, my mother would make me practice every I mean, I had to practice every day. No, the little kids would come out, can Azar come out? No, he can't, not until he finished practicing. And so uh, through that, so this is an inanimate object, uh, an instrument. Oh, the voice is different, but I mean, but still, to gain control over it, one must be in touch with it daily, you know, uh, to connect with it and to, uh, you know, send your, or extend yourself through this inanimate object. You know, you have to be, you, you have to morph with the uh, molecules. Your molecules have to command and morph and control the molecules of this uh, seemingly inanimate object and to uh, an animate it. And so if you can animate, whatever instrument you choose has to be one that is, you know, you feel. I mean, when we're, oh man, I, oh, I like that sound. You know, it, you get the signs and the prompts uh, come from within and, you know, from the universe and, and the signs just throughout life. The very signs of which way to go in whatever endeavor you're doing 
are present and become apparent if you take the time to listen and look. You know, so that's how I try to do. You know, so well, I mean, what do you think the universe has in store for you next? Well, if the universe and I say the same, then it's a very good, big, uh, you know, uh, we have some visions that, uh, I have a group uh, that, my new group is called Electric Czar. And uh, I'm pursuing uh, something I've been doing over the years, but I haven't come out with it. It's uh, non-acoustic, and acoustic, um, you know, and uh, I'm playing, uh, the piano, acoustic piano, as great as it is, all those instruments, bass, all electric, uh, uh, acoustic bass, all of those, saxophone, violin, all of these things came out of the 18th century and are the technology of the 18th century. So now we have technology of today. And so uh, I'm endeavoring to uh, couple those and experiment and come out and see where I come, you know, something that's pleasing and inspiring to people. But my whole thing is to uplift uh, and, and heal through music, through the upliftment of it. If, if you hear some music that, you know, later on you're or right then and, you know, wow, man, I got an idea or, man, you know, I got goosebumps or, wow, I really feel good, it relaxed me, or, you know, uh, you know, wow, man, if I thought of some good stuff in there, now I'm thinking, or, I had some different ideas because of that. Or, you know, those type of things are all healing in the sense that it's uplifted you and moved you forward. That's my uh, endeavor has been, you know, to uh, cause that to occur. Okay. Well, I think it's time to put your thoughts and actions into, into your music. And oh, okay. And hear you play. So Yay. how about a round of applause for Azar Morris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Very good.